Um, hi, my name is Ebony. Um, I'm a visual artist with a background in archaeology, anthropology, and sociology. All the colonial stuff. <laughs> uh, I'm now doing my PhD at um, Goldsmiths in visual sociology. Mm -hmm. Uh, hello, my name is Subhadra Das. I am the curator of the science collections at University College London, part of a department here called UCL Culture. 60 members of staff, one of them a person of colour and permanent, that's me. Uh, I'm also a curator, so it turns out in the context of this room, a bloody unicorn. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm also homegrown, so you will have heard from a comment earlier. I uh, first came to UCL 20 years ago, I studied archaeology, so I'm also a failed archaeologist. <laughs> and um, yeah, I the, the collections I work with, probably the thing I want to say to you is that up until about seven years ago, I was the whitest brown person you were ever going to meet <laughs> until we found out about the current cabinet. So, uh, <laughs> so this, uh, for me, uh, learning about the history of science and learning uh, about uh, and taking a critical race theory approach to the history of science has been a real revelation. And so the things that you hear me say, very much the zeal of a convert, take that however you will. Um, but that's my position and mm -hmm. outcome of that. Uh, my name's Karan Um I work for a, um, a mentoring charity called Arts Emergency, um, which is a network of privileged for people without privilege. Um, we produced a report called Panic Report, which um, was about um, uh, diversity in uh, the cultural and creative sectors. Um, it showed that 2.7% you know, of people who work in museums and galleries are of a non-white background. Um, I also am a failed archaeologist. Um, <laughs> I did my MA um, at the IOA um, and did cultural heritage in the archaeology department. Um, I tried to do archaeology for my undergraduate and quit after a year. Um, but I really tried not to study archaeology basically and kind of always ended up doing it in some way. <laughs> Yeah. So, so kind of rejection seems to be quite a big theme here. And I'm not talking about the sector rejecting you. It's kind of you rejecting archaeology in, in a sense. Why did you choose um, to, uh, to study something else that wasn't archaeology? Yeah. Um, so I think I, I kind of stumbled across archaeology as like a concept, like I pretty much had no idea what it was. Um, aside from Indiana Jones, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then when I, um, I must have just gone through like a university list and stopped at A, mm -hmm. I did, I yeah. did archaeology <laughs> and archaeology at Durham. Um, and I found the whole thing quite disorientating. I think mm -hmm. I grew up in London, um, in East London. I went to Durham, which was predominantly white. Mm -hmm. I was the only white person in my college, about 400 people. I was the only white person in the course, which was about 200 people. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have a single black lecturer. I didn't have, I had one South. Asian lecturer mm -hmm. um, for my three years. So I think the whole thing was kind of felt a bit, it just felt a bit odd. Yeah. Um, and I guess it was the first time that I thought I was going to learn. It's very like diaspora thing where you're like, I'm going to learn about my heritage and learn about mm -hmm. my culture. Um, but a lot of that was learning from white professors and mm -hmm. um, reading books written by white explorers. <laughs> so it always felt a bit, yeah, it felt a bit off. So after mm -hmm. a year, I was like, I can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And then I did anthropology, which, you know. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, so <laughs> yeah. But I think that speaks volumes that you had to switch from archaeology to yeah. anthropology. Yeah. And, and maybe that was just a tiny, really bit better. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And why would you consider yourself a failed archaeologist? So? Um, I guess, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, I've got very clean fingernails <laughs> and a big trowel. Uh, so I, I have done excavation, I've done all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think I always probably really did want to work in museums. Um, so, so failure in one bit of the career isn't necessarily um, a failure altogether. Uh, but I, so the, I think I'll answer the question by saying what made me opt out, mm -hmm. which is despite the overall whiteness, um, the times when I was butting up against ideas that were to do with whiteness. So interpretations of megalithic monuments as church rather than temple, for example. Mm -hmm. I realized that if I wanted to bring that forward, I would have to kind of, at the time, pretty much single-handedly invent a whole new archeology span of religion. Mm -hmm. And I'm really clever, but um, that's a lot. That sounds exhausting. <laughs> yeah, and it was just a side thought, you know, yeah. there was one side thought in one seminar. Mm -hmm. It's too much. Yeah. It was too much for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel the same about a black feminist archaeology mm -hmm. approach. And that's something that I've spoken to Corentim about before and the kind of absence of, um, I suppose, approaches um, and kind of looking at black women in the historical um, record. It could be a whole new 
thing itself, but it's exhausting if you're doing it there on your own. Is still here. Hello. Hi. Yay. Mm -hmm. um, how have you found that? <laughs> I have to think about that question a bit more. Um, but I think, I don't know, also it's colored by the fact that I'm not British. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, my, yeah, anyway. <laughs> it's complicated, as is everything in, yeah. uh, in this. Um, so I think, yeah, that probably colors my perception a bit. Um, because I, I moved countries as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that, that changes my, and, you know, the U.S. has its own very complicated and problematic mm -hmm. um, history, which actually I fit into in very odd ways that you might not expect. So, mm -hmm. I don't know about. So, I'm just putting you on the spot, but it just felt hard yeah. to yeah, blame someone. Yeah, <laughs> everybody does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, um, sub, you've um, you've created a, a display. It's the display of, of power at the Grant Museum of Zoology. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yes. Um. Yep. Yeah. Not to... single. Not single handed. I need to point out. So, okay. um, it's an exhibition that my colleagues. Uh, so, Tanis Davidson, who's the curator of the Grant Museum, Lu Luan Mahitia, who's head of Zoology mm -hmm. and Science Collections and also Hannah Cornish, who um, is my job chair, um, a science collections curator. Four curators is a lot for one exhibition, um, but it worked out well. Uh, if you get the chance to go, so the Grant Museum is just opposite the main gates of UCL on Gower Street. It's on the intersection with University Street. It's open this afternoon from one to five. It'll be open tomorrow afternoon at the same time. The exhibition is called Displays of Power. And uh, what I wanted to do and what we did collectively was problematise natural history museums in the same way that archaeology and art museums have been problematised. So we're all very comfortable, to varying degrees, with the conversation about the fact that um, art museums in the UK and in the US contain looted material, or that they are the byproduct of colonial activity. My experience coming into the sciences um, was the fact that scientists don't think that this history is theirs. Um, and biologists in particular, they're all very much about the science. Um, this is an elephant. Elephants live in Asia. Let's not think about how this elephant skull happens to be in London. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, you know, it's all about the biome, it's all about the biodiversity. Important stories, but not the entire story. So what Displays of Power does is ask the very simple question, how did all these animals come to be in this space? And not, so not just the processes by how they got here, but why here? Um, I wanted to problematise zoology collecting, but also the role of UCL as a university and as a colonial agent. Um, how it did that through its sheer existence, but also how it perpetuated that through the education system. Um, all of that is there. Um, and one really powerful piece is an intervention by a poet called Yomi Sode, who has given voice to the indigenous peoples whose voices have been entirely written out of that museum and its collection. So much of our knowledge about animals um, from, and, and so much of the work that was done to collect animals in natural history collections was done by local people and their role is exercised entirely. They are, they are subaltern, there is no voice for them. His work is phenomenally powerful in bringing that voice back, even if it's only a little bit. Uh, so I would encourage you to, to go and see it. We should have organised a, a later opening for that one as well, but it'll be open tomorrow. See what you can do. I wanted to ask, um, so I went to see the exhibition, I think a couple of weeks ago, actually, um, and I thought it was great. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> feedback. Um, but I, uh, one question that I, I, I went home with was, what was the reception of the of, of the museum specifically, and also I guess of UCL as an as an institution um, with with this, and because I mean the labels were very very honest. Um, so yeah, what was the reception, and was there any resistance or yeah? Um, so I know no one ever believes me when I say this, but my department is entirely supportive of this kind of work. Uh, this is sort of the second kind of decolonial exhibition that I've done. Um, the first one was to do with the history of eugenics. Um, I don't, there's 10 people signed up for my walking tour this afternoon. Um, so that was the first time of doing that. But then there have been plenty of other people, other researchers, other historians, um, archaeologists as well at UCL who have been dealing, um, taking a decolonial approach to kind of doing these stories. So they are certainly supportive. 
Now, whether they are encouraging or not is a different story. So um, it turns out that the role, for example, of the Media and Communications Office at UCL is not what I thought it was. It turns out it's not there to promote my exhibition, um, which is kind of what you think it would be given the title. Um, it, it turns out that they have other things to do in terms of ensuring the solidity of UCL's reputation. Um, I'm aware this is being filmed. Um, <laughs> and I'm aware that if they fire me for it, they should be aware I will call them racist. <laughs> so it's a different thing to, resistance is a different thing mm -hmm. to encouragement, I would say. Um, and so while, while people are perfectly happy, I think, to let me play in this little sandbox, which they think is mine, um, which they, I hope, are now starting to realise is actually more the work of not only our department, but the university as a whole. Um, we're, we're getting there, but that's not the same thing as going, yes, we're going to look at our structural issues and we're going to do something about changing them. Um, Ebony, you've done um, some really interesting <coughs> work, actually, and probably one of the first people I've encountered to be sort of doing that kind of work on medicinal practice, and that, that's what I was, I think I heard you speak at Winchester, actually. Even though you can't remember it, I was the only brown face in the room, and you still know, still don't I remember me. But yeah, um, can you tell us a bit more about about the work that you're doing? So uh, I, I've been I was roped in many years ago by Dr. Snell and over there uh, to teach every now and again um, on the child module, and I after just lots of travelling and lots of talking and supposedly the ethnography. Really, in the, in the proper sense of the word, with people looking at medicinal practices or healing practices. So I'm really interested in how people in, in the non-biomedical, non-Western medical sphere approach the body, approach healing, approach life, approach how we see sickness, health, and those kind of issues, really. It's very different when you, when you cross into different cultures how even some cultures don't even recognise medicine as a word. Mm -hmm. So I just thought that was really, really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was particularly useful to me because a lot of the sort of papers I'd read at undergraduate would refer to um, some medicinal practices as, as witchcraft, which yeah. I found quite um, alienating. And um, that was probably the first session where I'd actually heard medicinal practice referred to as medicinal practice. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was that was really rewarding, and it kind of emphasises the point that when we're in an academic environment, we need to be, I suppose, um, encouraging sort of wider interpretation of evidence and acknowledging that there are other voices out there um, that could competently teach our modules. Um, and, and, and yeah, that's definitely a theme that I've found kind of running through today. And perhaps, Karantima, if you'd encountered Ebony at, at Durham, your view of archaeology <laughs> might be, you know, might be different, as, as is mine. And it's one of the reasons why I've kind of managed to stay in archaeology is the fact that I have been lucky enough or privileged enough um, to um, encounter people who are interested and um, engaged with similar um, interests of mine. So, yeah. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Danica, there we go. <laughs> I have a question for Ebony. I was wondering, this thing about medicinal practices from other parts of the world, um, more and more we see this pop up now as alternative medicine. Um, we see all kinds of appropriations of, from India, Ayurveda, for example. Um, do you think that that's more harmful than there being no acknowledgement whatsoever or no public awareness? Or do you think that, that public awareness is better than... <laughs> I, I don't know if I would say there was public awareness <laughs> because it then implies that only one group of people's awareness is the awareness that matter. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, everyone else that was practicing that was aware of it. Obviously, they were practicing it. So I'm not sure if it automatically becomes more valid just because we acknowledge it in, in, in Western countries, I think that's a little bit problematic. At the same time, I have no problem with things becoming much more popularised if the origins of them are kind of considered, and I think that's where we have a problem, and language specifically kind of tends to twist things around and take things from their origins and their roots and relabel them however it's kind of suits us really. Yeah. Kathy, were you going to ask? 
Yeah, I was going to throw uh, this question back at you and how, uh, for the whole panel, um, how do you see real effective change, you know, that out of the sandbox, like not, you know, not mm -hmm. just one person of colour um, in leadership roles, uh, you know, do you see the discipline of archaeology, for instance, becoming more balanced in its representation and how? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't expect you to solve that uh, immediately, but you might, you know, do you have anything to... I'm going to go with a solid no on mm -hmm. that one. Uh, I don't see it. You only need to look around the room to not see it. And this is good. This is a good, yeah, like, well. this is, the, this is well. an example of a good room, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the kinds of work that you're doing, which is acknowledging the history, is a super important first step. Um, because it's not just about decolonizing the curriculum, it's about decolonizing our minds as well. I would argue, uh, this isn't a really solidarity type thing to say, but I would argue that having more people of colour at higher level, again, I'm going to give you the cabinet as an example, having people of colour at senior level is not necessarily the solution if it's the case that they are simply the product of the system. Again, I mean, this could have very easily been me had I, you know, scum does rise. Um, so it's, I, I think, for me, okay, here's, okay, here's the solution. Um, because, because decolonizing, as I, I can only get to the decolonizing the mind kind of bit of it at this point in time, witness that I was so much happier listening to Elizabeth's paper. Did I get your name right just there? Yeah. Yes as opposed to the moment Dan started talking about the BM and sponsorship, I was like, bitch, hands off my money. <laughs> right? That's uncomfortable for everyone in this room. Mm. Um, because that's where the real change is. The, what museums need to start doing is to understand that objects are not the most important thing. People are the most important thing. Relationships with people mm. are the most important thing. Trying to be apolitical and neutral in this situation is actively um, adding to systemic inequality in this country and it's actively adding to um, just a, a political nightmare of a situation worldwide. We need to dismantle a cis heteropatriarchy and we need to dismantle capitalism. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, <laughs> black people in senior positions is all well and good for keeping the current situation going. But that's not the way forward, I don't think, for our society as a whole. Mm -hmm. that, that's what, what dismantling the patriarchy is the way forward. <laughs> I, I, dismantling the patriarchy is a, a fundamental step. Mm -hmm. History is not a zero-sum game. Society is not about shouldn't be about winners and losers. It should be about us all helping each other. The issue is that you know something like that is a very radical uh, uh, yeah. goal, and it requires revolution. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. I think as, as well, like uh, a lot of museums, organisations look at themselves at being decolonial, but then if you think about who's being fed into museums and heritage institutions. Like, what I've always found quite interesting during my course, so I finished my MA about two years ago, was that we, I spent, did it over two years, I did it part time. We talked so much about like, looking at museums and heritage institutions and UNESCO really critically, but we never looked at the university structure critically at all during that whole time. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people really do reflect on the way that things are being taught in their lessons. Like, I, I, I find it quite difficult spending those two years being taught in a way that's sometimes quite um, imperial, I would say, mm -hmm. um, and trying to produce work that's critical is difficult to do when the people who are teaching it aren't critical of their own practice. So there was a bit, there was quite a lot of um, disconnect there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. like about it's about legitimizing knowledge, and I think we still yeah. legitimize the same people's knowledge, and it's still kind of. I mean, there are other people who are historians and archaeologists, even though they might not call themselves archaeologists, who do work, but because we don't recognise them, they're just kind of invisible to us and I think that that's where the problem starts really is that you know, I think we need to democratise knowledge making in yeah. general really.